It's my pleasure to announce uh, Tina Weidner, who received her MA in Restoration Art Technology and Conservation Science from the Technical University of Munich in 2004 in Germany. Since 2005, she has worked in time as a time-based media um, conservator at the Tate in London, where she is responsible for exhibitions and displays of time-based media works of art. Since 2011, Tina has been seconded into research to conduct the project Dying Technology, the end of 35 millimeter slide transparencies. This project develops a preservation strategy for slide-based artworks in Tate's collection, but moreover also explores and captures the legacy of the medium. Please join me in welcoming Tina. Many thanks, Christina, for the um, introduction. I think I roughly want to um, start you off with how my labor, is the mic on? Yeah, how my labor of love for slide technology started. And um, I think in, until 2006, Tate owned four slide-based works, and within a couple of years, we suddenly acquired so many works that also went immediately on display that we simply didn't have a chance to catch up with all the archiving and also not with uh, providing enough exhibition copies at the time because by then we felt that the uh, commercial expertise that was out there suddenly disappeared like if the analog eyes that were once overseeing that process have suddenly disappeared or if morale got so low that simply the time that was needed to produce good quality slide duplicates wasn't there any longer. And at that time, I set off with one of my colleagues who was a senior photographer at Tate for more than 40 years and to have a look around what is there in London and who can produce what. And we sort of stuck our noses in the labs to see how they run their bath and get an idea what their size tank is and how much they can uh, process in a week and whether those two figures really correlate. And um, we sort of came to the conclusion that we need to better understand what slide duplicating really constitutes of, because quite often I as a conservator think that I'm asking for the impossible, just to sort of trying to communicate to those individuals to improve on that and that side without really knowing what that means and how difficult it is to do that. So I started with Rod to um, duplicate slides in house, and um, Rod was an aqua lab technician, so he had a very good idea about filtration, but also about the processing side of things. Because I think with, the, uh, with all the unknowns, quite often a slide duplicate is very much a moment in time which depends on the sort of performance of your eyes on that day, on the temperature of the bath and how well the chemicals are controlled at the processing side of things, and then how well those two factors tally up and um, my slide school of seeing that I'm going to present you with sort of draws on that expertise that I inherited from Rod and also on working with a new lab in Germany for the past two years, which simply love to duplicate slides. And I think that's a slightly European, perhaps, side of things that, that you sort of carry on doing things also if they're not really commercially profitable any longer. And um, we shut the lights. What I'm trying to do is to, um, first of all, help you to um, give you more knowledge about what it actually is that you're looking at and what slide duplicating even in its heyday constituted of and why it was so difficult, but also to sort of gain a little bit of that terminology that is needed to really be able to communicate about those differences that you see. And um, I will slightly sort of lead you into the dilemmas of being analog, but then also in the even greater dilemmas of trying to go digital. And um, f for me as a conservator, I very much struggled with grasping 
the digital side, especially when it comes to photography, because color management is something that works for some things, but doesn't for others. It may create errors. And I think that what sort of strikes me the most is that all that knowledge that is out there in within the color science community really hasn't been distributed to those professionals that work on the bench, that work in the labs, or also to the conservators that would need to have that knowledge in order to make those informed decisions how digitization should be done. We start off with a sort of a couple of basics just to remind ourselves what it is that that physical medium constitutes of, and then we move into a number of case studies to particularly look into issues of aspect ratio, of cropping, of slide mounts, and to a color filtration, of matching that and adjusting it, and also about the different slide technologies that are out there and the importance of slide stock. The first set of images is a tree as a composite, and um, the buildup of the slide film is an RGB as unprocessed film and a CMY as processed film. So the top layer is a blue sensitive one that has invisible yellow couplers. So the blue will develop as yellow. And then the next following one will be red. That will be green, which develops as magenta. And red that develops as cyan. And especially the um, cyan, magenta, and the yellow tones is, is what you're looking at when it comes to um, filtration. When you do take those three images in cyan and magenta and yellow and overlay them as a composite, you will achieve the left hand image. And we carry on on both. Something to visualize is when that the size of an in-camera original roughly matches the outer size of that compound setup grid. But when you make subsequent copies of that, you have a slight crop on that edge where the uh, line with the triangles is. But that slight change in aspect ratio only really exists when you go from the in-camera original to the first generation du tube. And from that onwards, you could pretty much hold the exact same size. Those two images on the left-hand side is um, the grid that is mounted in a tube mount, which allows you to have the full window aspect of the slide visible when duplicating. And on the uh, right-hand side is a pin registered mount. When going to unpin registered in a more channel purpose mount, you even have a little bit further of an overlay around the image because the shift of the slide in the mount can differ to a greater extent. Next two. I think when mentioning pin registration, <coughs> I just quickly want to touch upon what that really means. So we know that a slide is 36 millimeter wide and 24 millimeter high. And it has normally a two millimeter black gap in between the images. In this case, the camera didn't transport that the film pin registered because your outer edge of the image should line up with the outer edge of the perforation and it should stretch exactly over the width of eight perforations. I once in a while have to refocus a little bit because I'm using different mounts throughout, so bear with me. That is a pair of images where I actually wanted to show you two things. I think one of them is that you see that gray bracket at the top, which is a sign for that either the slide hasn't been aligned properly before it was duplicated, or that it was duplicated in its mount due to which that gray bar was 
exposed onto the duplicate. And quite often, whenever misalignment is happening, that results also in a problem of then later mounting them. And for example, here you see that, this, that the perforation holes start to show. Last year, I did a test, just out of curiosity, to see whether classless mounts or class mounts would actually be more recommendable for display. And this is, I think, coming from, from the approach in assuming that the slides have been handled well and that we know who will and does them and will be wearing gloves, but, but also to get an idea of whether microclimate and, and heat pockets inside the class mounts could cause more um, exaggerated deterioration. And I found back then that there was a difference between classless and class mounts towards that um, classless mount, uh, slides that are mounted in classless mounts would be, would be fading less rapidly. And I've redone that test just a couple of weeks ago just to reprove that point. And that time around, it actually didn't make any difference whatsoever. Kate, on the uh, left hand side, the next one. So those are the both. On the uh, right hand side is the classless and on the uh, left hand side is the class mount. And I think on a more general things, on a more general matter, it's it's quite often if you look into time that that is required to mount and how well a slide sits in its mount. The I think the advantage of classless is that you can avoid those dark patchy areas that are often trapped moisture inside the mount to sort of appear on the slide and then sort of slightly move towards the outer edge until it becomes invisible. But quite often that's only really happening when the slides are cold during the first run and sort of then equalized during a number of um, run-throughs. But um, I think classless mounts often do allow for better focus, especially when using pin registered mounts where the slide is really stretched in the mount to have a very even surface. Then, Kate, on the uh, right-hand side, that is another example of a slide that had been duplicated in a slightly strange manner because you also see that white strip at the bottom of the image, which is the um, bracket of your of your compound table. So I think originally there would have been more image on the bottom edge and, and the, uh, the bracket that covers the slide and holds it flat hasn't been adjusted properly. Then we go to the next two. This is an example of what happens in the course of a one-year display where the, uh, it's a work by John Jonas called Juniper Tree and um, consisted of 80 slides, so one carousel, that um, have been changed every 10 seconds. And we just sort of quickly go through also to, to be reminded why it is so crucial to have enough duplicates to um, successfully be able to display works. And also the uh, sort of rapid color changes that are happening. And I think especially on that example, you see that the uh, magenta is almost entirely gone, whereby the cyan is still holding up a little bit better, and you just get that overall yellowish tint. And again. This is an example which I'm going to talk about later on a little bit more in detail, with the sort of differences in color appearance, but on that point here, I think I wanted to draw your attention to the sort of edge marks and, um, and codes. I think the difference between slide duplicating and film duplicating is that with film, you always have a very good chance of doing sort of edge mark forensics because when you print film or when you strike your negative from your inter positive and then subsequent prints from the inter uh, from the inter negative you always have this sort of edge mark code printing through so even after a couple of years you could still sort of try to cross reference your material and sort of build up 
hierarchies or if you've missed out on doing the production diagrams, I think that's what you would be looking for. But for slides you can't because you're only ever capturing the image area that sits in between the perforations on either side. But when looking at the sort of slide stocks that do have numbers on them, that indicates that a strip of 36 exposures has been used, which is not common for a slide duplicating stock, which often either um, exists in roads of 100 foot or 400 foot. So whenever you have Kodak e tube or Fuji CDU and no sort of exposure number, you can be certain that it is a duplicate. With um, especially the Kodak E100 Chibo, that is, that is also a film that is that was very fashionable to be used in film recorders. So whenever you had a digital original, you could record that back. So that could be as well a camera original or a digitally produced duplicate. Then we change on the left hand side. This is something that I was very eager to see because since Kodak E100 G discontinued in March this year, we've been looking for a film to substitute this one. And I've been talking loads to Kodak motion picture and to Kodak photography because we always had the suspicion that the motion picture equivalent, which is also color reversal, um, was the make uh, Kodak E100D for Delta, actually has very little difference in emulsion. I think the difference that you see, especially in the black levels, where the fly sits, may have to do that the anti-halation layer in the motion picture stock is more substantial than it is in the stills photography one. And what the anti-halo layer does is once the um, light has traveled through the emulsion, it sort of will be absorbed by the halation, by the anti-halation layer, not to reflect back into, um, into your emulsion layers, which, which would have caused reflection and sort of halo effects in within the image. And the other recognizable difference is the uh, sort of style of the spocket holes, where those rather square ones with the slightly rounded edge are KS registrations, those rounded ones are BH, but a lot of the analog duplicating machines or also trick tables, as they've been referred to, can transport both perforations. And the same applies that, that the BH perforations also fit in pin registered mounts as long as you're only using three Ts. So 16 pack mounts wouldn't be an option for this film. Can we carry on? This is an example where which is an LVT recording, which Doug already explained yesterday. It's not really a good one, but um, I think what you see here is that the spocket holes are not really, or that the perforation holes are not really perforation holes because they have that slightly rough edge. And what that lab has been doing is to, um, to scan the perforations and then to have that as mask in, in Photoshop where then the individual digitized frames will be dropped in, and I think that one is also a little bit on the small side and it's not really matching the size that it should have. And we carry on. This is again a um, sheet film, which is, I think, a little bit about emulsions is that there is a world of film out there where one and the same emulsion is um, packaged differently. So the roll film has, has a thinner base in order to be able to roll inside your camera, where the sheet film is a more static sheet of film that just sits in a cassette. And, um, and here you see that those films, especially when they're cut out of a larger sheet, they wouldn't have any perforations at all. And we carry on. This is a test that we just did out of curiosity. So we made our own grayscale target and uh, looked into sort of resolution where the feather sits and the business card from the German slide lab that I'm working with and the, uh, the compound grid. And um, all of those, or both, and the uh, next coming one, 
They were taken with the same camera, the same lens, the same lighting condition, processed in the same bath at the same day, and you see already that distinct difference. So in an ideal world, mm -hmm. you would think that those two will sit a lot closer, but they aren't. And I think it's not, not only that perhaps the sort of color gamut and the dyes that are used in those two films differ significantly, but it could also be that in the way how the film behaves during the processing, that one might be more sensitive towards the front end of the process. So when, when the first bath isn't right, then that will show a different cast like the Velvia 50 will do. And I think there is like any possible combination out there of things that uh, simply turn out differently. And we carry on. So that's another example with Aqua R62, where you already see quite a substantial magenta cast. And I think when judging that, it's very difficult to do that when um, looking at the, uh, at the sort of color reference chart. And quite often what, what you go with is, is to sort of look at the mid-tone grays and how well they're being represented. And we carry on. Then I think in the next attempt, we used the digital camera, same light, and then recorded that back through a CRT film recorder, which is an Aqua PCR2, to look whether the tonality would be more neutral. And that Aqua film recorder was calibrated before, but we then also did another color strip to look at the density of the gray patches, and we saw that, that it was very minor to really go back and, and adjust the curves further, and we did another pre-recording a little bit later, which came to this result. So there's a small difference in, in, in tonal range, but, but then again, still close enough, and we carry on. So this was the self-made target. And now we come to the uh, professional target, which is a color Q60. And I've been banging my head in the last two months to um, sort of make full use of all the uh, information that a Kodak Q60 should hold when profiling your scanner and to learn about color management and to talk to color scientists and see how well does this actually work if you are moving from one slide stock to another and how well can I map the color gamut? And I think my findings are is that a lot of photographers and photography labs sort of do their sort of rule by thumb adjustment where they primarily check that the uh, minimum density and the maximum density is, is within where it should sit, but they're very rarely really look in the representation of the different hues and the saturation and the lightless levels, and that all of that is sort of sitting within a closed circle of color scientists. But I think for, for us and for those professionals that still sort of feel full-heartedly for color photography and also for those how to manage that move from analog to digital, I think there is a lot more knowledge that, that needs to be brought out into that field and also to us to really understand how we do that before we can comfortably start digitizing because that alone will create new artifacts that we need to be prepared for. Okay, we carry on. Christine, can I just ask, are those 10 minutes left? Yes. Okay, so um, I sort of enforce a little bit in speed and we uh, skipped those, so those were targets that were on different stocks. So what we've tried was a Fuji, was a Q60 on Fuji Chrome, on Ecta Chrome and Encoder Chrome, tried to scan them, do the uh, color calibration with the Silverfast software, and then had the uh, patch data attached to that and they were automatically controlled, but the Kodak Chrome is still standing out because that's something that we can't match to the extent how we would desire it to do. And that's a resolution target which also shows you, especially when scanning, how well your scanner performed or whether it created any artifacts. We carry on. This is a work by Hilary Lloyd that Tate acquired in 2008, which we've tried to archive for the past four years. 
And the problem with that work is that Hillary's Instagram camera had a small error because the shutter didn't close and bounced the light back. So the slide has a light strip at the bottom, which she wanted to um, eliminate during the duplicating process. And her previous experience was that the commercial labs would be quite generously zooming in instead of chopping off some of the ears or the car on your left. And our task was to find out how little zoom we can get away with to, um, to not make that strip visible any longer and how to visualize that for Hillary. So we carry on. Kate also on the, um, <coughs> on the right. And what we've been doing is to expose the uh, compound grid onto the slide so that we could exactly see where we are and within the grid and also visualize that for Hillary. And what we've been doing is to zoom in for 102% and have a 0.2 millimeter offset to the bottom edge so that we crop as little as possible from the image area around. And that's on the right hand side is a first generation tube and on the left hand side a second generation tube. And so you're seeing that this line sits closer to the edge, but the area that is within the triangled line is exactly the same as you can see on the next two slides. Kate on the right as well. So it is the same exact image from a first generation here to a second generation, and we haven't been losing anything further around the edges, which was a valid point to prove for Hillary, because so far she's only ever been duplicating from her in-camera original, which always caused great headaches. Carry on. This is a test that is on Kodak eTube, where we wanted to look into the uh, resolution and also whether there is a visible loss between the two generations. This is a second generation tube and this is a first generation tube. When looking at that on the light box, you sort of see on the black strip of the brickwork that the uh, that the cement is a little bit less. But I think when projected, I can't make out a difference on first sight. And the next two. <coughs> this is the same example on Fuji CDU2. Again, with the uh, with the naked eye, no much difference. This is another case study that we've made, which is a work by Mark Hamid called Partial Eclipse, which is a single channel slide projection, a performance, and a sculptural component. And the particular challenge here was to find the right stock to duplicate that work. It consists of 45 black and white slides and uh, 140 color slides. And we went through a phase where we sort of started off to talk to the gallery and the artist where that those obviously black and white created images should have such a sign cast on the uh, Kodak eTube stock or whether we can improve that further to move the tonage into a more sort of black and white typical image. And we uh, sort of did that by changing the filtration, Kate, we carry on. And edit more magenta and we carry on. And you see that that created quite a significant magenta cast on another image of that series. So a uh, filtration that works for one series of images may not necessarily work for other images in that series. And the sort of tonal scale and the mids also has that magenta cast we carry on. So we've adjusted that, compensated with yellow and sort of are in a more neutral spectrum here. And then the man with the new filtration, we carry on. So the magenta cast has reduced and we carry on. And so did the uh, two test images and we carry on. And we've sort of been uh, doing that for, I think, a series of 10 different filtrations. And on the right-hand side, that's the best example that we could achieve on the Kodak eTube color stock, just to have that black and white appearance and we carry on. And the same again. So this is what we were given at the, uh, from the gallery, and this is what we uh, achieved. And I then took those tests with me to meet Carl, uh, to meet Mark and his gallerist, 
and to show him our results. And this is the moment where they suddenly came up with that actually, if we are capable of doing that, then we should be working from his in camera originals and not from his um, sort of substandard color tube. So we did a new test series, especially looking into black and white reversal stock. So this is a sort of example that should stand instead of the uh, camera originals as I can show them here. And then we, we did another test where we've been looking into scanning the images, reversing them into Photoshop, writing them back onto black and white negative film because at that time we weren't able to locate enough Aqua Scala film that you could also process as positive. So we've reversed the images in Photoshop and put them back on film as negative, which would then turn out as positive during the uh, processing. And that was a sort of unsatisfying result for this film, which is a Rulai ATS. And then we did another one on Rulai or 25, which would have been our preferred option if we weren't able to locate the Aquascala stock. And I think with, with this film, which is sort of unbelievable in terms of resolution, is also how much more detail it really tweaks out. And that was detailing that, that wasn't visible in the original and that also isn't visible in the scan in that way. And it is really the sort of final resolution of um, the, the 300 lines and that very slow film that sort of tweaks out that quality and we carry on. And then um, in the, uh, after a couple of weeks, we were able to locate enough Aquascala film, which you can still get secondhand, but the Aquascala process has only really been done in two places in the world. One is the year five in Denver, Colorado, and the second one is Photo Studio 13 in Stuttgart. And we carry on. So we've improved the filtration further and um, this is again the comparison, so that would be what we were given and this is how close we got. And the next two, same here, this is what we were given, this is what we were given and this is what we've achieved. And we carry on. This is another example of, um, for color filtration, it's a work by David Lamelas, which consists of a three channel slide projection and a single channel 16 millimeter projection. And this was one of our in-house examples of duplicating. This is a work that was made in the 1970s and we acquired it in, uh, Tate acquired it in 2010. So that work had a 30 life cycle of unknown provenance and we don't know whether the slides we were given have been used for display or whether they were just stored under inappropriate conditions. But I think at the end we were about at the 25th color filtration set just to match this particular work because the uh, I think the the color gamut has changed and it was quite difficult. So I just quickly take you through how we sort of approach such a thing. On the right hand side you see a duplicate which doesn't has any color filtration at all and on the right hand side is what we were what Tate was given. And then on the left hand side we've um, used the filtration that was uh, suggested by Kodak which is sort of stamped on the box and especially for slide duplicating film due to the um, precision that you require there is a deviation and emulsion and, um, and due to the filtration suggestion it already tells you in which direction to take that work in process and in this case I think it's at 37 and a half yellow and 10 cyan and this is what that is but obviously we need to change that further. And um, I then did one with minus 10 yellow just to see where we lie in within those two and we carry on. And I then sort of brought the yellow up a little bit further just to get closer. And um, then also started to play with the exposure time and to bring the sign a little bit down because we were nearly there and I think we were especially looking at, at the sort of frail branches in the birch tree and the sort of gravel and the puddles and whether this line of trees in the valley would still be visible and we carry on. And this was the final result, which I think was then approach 11 to 16 and, and 0.4 seconds and we carry on. And again, and again. So this is um, still a work in process. It's a work by Lothar Baumgarten, 
which is called, I prefer it here better than in Westphalia. And um, it's been shot over a duration of four years f in during the mid 80s. And this is what Lothar did in preparation for his residency at the Amazon. But it was all shot on the outskirts of Cologne. Because originally I was under the suspicion that Lothar has been carrying this dog for quite a long time in his backpack while he was shooting them, but he hasn't. On the left hand side, you see, okay, can you go back? On the left hand side is a Kodak e tube duplicate, the second generation. And on the right hand side, we sort of started to test the uh, <coughs> digitizations that, that Loda has overseen just to get an idea whether that quality would allow us to be recorded back onto film or whether those digital scans would only be used to digitally project in future time. Shall that be the only option to show that work any longer? And I think what I wanted to draw your attention to are those luscious reds. This is an E100G that is recorded in a Aqua PCR film recorder, and then we carry on on the left-hand side. That again is the motion picture equivalent, which has a lot more contrast, but also a far better color representation here, and we carry on. This is um, an LVT recording with a lab that is chronically running their bars too warm, and um, there is very little I can do as long as we tubed in-house. We would sort of compensate for that just by adding loads of cyan to sort of get rid of that very tonal warm appearance, but in that case, it is what it is. And this is my latest attempt in um, checking whether the uh, microfilm provided by Ilfochrome, which is developed as dye bleach similar or like the cyberchrome process, would have any advantages to be used as light duplicate. And obviously it is a lot lighter. And um, on paper, I think this shouldn't work because the uh, dynamic range of the color shouldn't even be there in, in order to achieve such a result. And this was a one-off shot on that side. And I think what I've been hoping is to work closer together with Google Microsafe in Switzerland to see whether we can improve on those tonal ranges and we carry on. Um, same here, I've been looking at the sort of of the uh, reproduction of blacks, how well you sort of can capture the, the luminance of the embers. That is a recording onto E100G with an aqua film recorder and we carry on. Christine, I think two minutes and I'm there. And um, again, the motion picture stock and the uh, Kate on the right, the micro, uh, the LVT recording, which is too warm, and we carry on and carry on. So the microfilm, which is a lot too light, and we carry on. I think this is and I think this is another example where especially the sort of appearance of the late afternoon sun is very very well captured on the on the left hand side, which is the e tube tube, but then sort of has a lot to uh, wish for on the right hand side, and we carry on. the motion picture reversal stock on the left and the microfilm on the right. And I think quite frankly, what, what my observations were, it's not that you sort of see the same level of, of tonal difference amongst the series of images. It's always that one film is sort of quite good to, to duplicate one detail but may let you down on others. So I think whenever you duplicate and especially before you make your informed decision, I think it's, it's to look at the variety of options because at the end of the day you always be making a compromise because 100% aren't possible. 
and then we carry on. So that is the microfilm and we carry on. Browns, really difficult to duplicate because you have very little color information. And Kate, let's just put the last one through in series and leave me with the uh, fade test for the microfilm. And this is because I've only received the, the test results from Google two weeks ago. I did a very quick exposure test just to see whether the Ilfochrome process would, as it um, specifies, less rapidly fade when the slides are projected. And what I've done is to simply turn the slide mount upside down so that I have a square window. And the sort of exposure lines are here on the black and I hear on the sort of orange and blue, and this slide has been exposed for roughly 40 hours continuously over three days. And just by sort of naked eye comparison, I would have thought that this shows roughly fifths less fading than what you would expect with a uh, with an E-tube or any other slide duplicating film. And um, I would like to thank Activity Studios in Esslingen for helping me and um, also for just being lovely and eager to produce slides and to believe in it. And Esme Fairburn, who has been funding my research in that project. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tina, for this sharing this fascinating project with us and again thank you for sharing your knowledge it was really a treat seeing your presentation thank you